Okay, welcome to lecture 16. Uh, we've remarkably, this is the way it should happen when you set it up and it just works um, and you start recording. Last time we had lots of technical difficulties. This time, somehow, remarkably, it just worked. So I think actually what had happened last time was, if you're interested, is it's the, it's the technical problem called not rebooting your machine for a month. So what happened was after I went back to my office, I, took, I realized that, the, that I hadn't rebooted the machine in a month. So after I rebooted it, suddenly everything started working. So I think what I need to, even though it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, even though it's a, it's a Mac, you still need to reboot occasionally. It's the, so that's the, that's the solution to all computer problems is just hit the reboot button. And look, look, it just worked perfectly now. Okay, so today uh, is lecture 16, um, and we're gonna we're here. Um, we're going to be talking about a number of interesting things. There's a new reading, um, which uh, we we might get to a little bit today, but um, I'm not sure yet. Depends on how things go. But it's chapter eight, which is the chapter on differential entropy. And so, so the way things are going to work, so so um, we're not we're probably not going to get a chance to get really into the Gaussian channel. So we're actually a little bit ahead of, like I said, where we where we where we are. So that, that's actually pretty good. We're doing pretty well schedule-wise. Uh, differential entropy is, is a form of continuous entropy. It's like entropy of, of non-discrete random sources. And this is important because you've probably heard the classic result about um, the capacity of a channel is related to log of 1 plus the signal noise ratio. Uh, and we're going to actually derive that result, but we're not going to be able to derive that result until we understand what um, differential entropy is. And differential entropy is described in chapter 8, but also the other thing that's really important about understanding differential entropy, there, there was something where when we were proving the channel capacity theorem, I was talking about how we could treat these typical sets as, as volumes. And how, for example, we, we looked at 2 to the n x, 2 to the n h of x divided by 2 to the n, or sorry, it was 2 to the n h of y divided by 2 to the n h of y given x. So it's the, it's the volume of the typical set versus the volume of the x conditional typical set. And when we talk about differential entropy, which can be negative, uh, it's going, we're going to relate that more specifically to volumes. And, and in particular, what, what might a negative entropy mean in that case? And I think what we'll do is once we talk about that as volumes, we'll come back to the discrete case and, and solidify our knowledge about how this sort of bin packing argument for the channel capacity theorem makes sense. But that's differential entropy. And we're going to need that, of course, to talk about the Gaussian channel, which probably we're really not going to get to next quarter. So I hope everybody's now signed up for next quarter. Uh, I'll remind you a couple more times. But like I said, it's really important to get a full grasp of information theory to, to take. Ten weeks is just not enough time. I don't think we're, you would be doing yourself or anybody justice by taking only ten weeks of information theory. So there's homework six. Um, it's, it's a very short one. It's only three problems. And two of the problems are actually pretty easy. So um, I hope you at least had a chance to look at it. It's due tonight. I've got office hours after, after class today. So if you've got any questions, you can come by or use Canvas or whatever. Um, and again, this is a reminder about the final exam. There's going to be an assignment that you need to... What, what will happen is you'll get an email with a scanned copy of your final, and your final assignment will be to upload the scanned copy to the Canvas page because, like I said, I can't do that. We can't. We don't have the privilege to upload homeworks for you. Okay, so let's let's do a review. So um, there was a question on the way over here that I, I just want to make clear. Um, you know, what are these review slides? So everything, we have this review section up here, right? So this is all this review, all this stuff. This sort of tells you which section we're in. Everything in the review section comes from a previous lecture. Okay. So the idea of this review section is what happens is I go back over previous lectures and I select slides from previous lectures that I think are important points. So it's sort of a summary of what, what we talked about, what I think is important to sort of start the gears grinding so that we can be up to speed by the time we actually start on the, on the new material. So if you're interested in like using these slides to review, review a, a midterm or, or final, which is probably more relevant for you, 
if you've reviewed everything up to, say, chapter 15, you can skip all of this stuff here. Okay, so literally, I mean, it's literally the same slides. It's actually literally the same LaTeX, exactly. It's not even copied and pasted, it's included. So any change made there is made here. So this is really only for in lectures. And then the new stuff happens after the review. Okay, so that's just, just something about the way these slides work, if, you were, if it wasn't clear to you. Um, in the past, actually, what I would do is add an extra slide maybe here or there. But this, this quarter, I was careful to make sure it was only a review, on, only copies of previous slides. OK, then here's one copy of previous slides. And, and the important thing that we proved last time is uh, the equivalence of the information capacity and the, and the supremum of, of achievability. So namely, we have the information capacity, which is the result of this optimization problem, and then the notion of achievability and the supremum of achievability. And what we're saying is that C, C gives us that supremum. C, C is the capacity in, in multiple senses. It's basically the result of an optimization problem, but it's also that rate beyond which we can't communicate without essentially an assured error or a guarantee of probability of error. And so again, restating that again, that says that you know, all rates below the capacity, there exists a sequence of codes such that the probability of error goes to zero. And then anything that has a probability of error going to zero must have the rate below the capacity. And, and again, just to sort of offer a little bit of intuition, further intuition, or you know, we've now done the proof or most of the proof. Actually, no, we've completed the proof now. Um, this is a very different notion. You know, it's not saying it's not saying you have absolute certainty that you can communicate without error. That's not what the proof is saying. If you communicate, if you communicate below the rate, you know, it's a noisy channel. There will be some probability of error. However, what you can do is decrease that probability to as small as you want, if you're not communicating. Um, above a certain rate. Whereas there's this critical point, the capacity, and if you try to communicate above a certain point, you can no longer decrease the error, unboundedly small. So the, the, the thing that happens is not, can you do, per like we say, we can do perfect communication below if we communicate be below the, the, the capacity. That's in some sense not really technically precise, although we say that, what we really mean is that the probability of error can be driven arbitrarily close to zero and exponentially fast to zero. doesn't mean it's perfect. There might be some, you know, you know, extraordinarily improbable event that you get some error, in which case you do get an error. But it's very different than what happens if you're trying to communicate at a rate higher than the capacity, which means that you cannot drive the error rate to zero, even with big block length. So any, any questions about that idea, now that we've done the proof, and now we've sort of, we said this idea, we gave this tuition, then we've done the proof, and now we're sort of going back and saying the intuition again. So are there any questions? Is this idea clear? Okay, so if I, on a final exam, say, Jim from EE514 has claimed that he's developed a code that allows you to communicate with probability of error zero for all rates below the capacity. What would you say to Jim? You should retake this class. Should retake this class? That's right. Maybe we take it a couple of times. Right. Um, and Jim, right. So, so think, think about that. I mean, that's that may be a hint for the final. I might ask some questions like that. Okay, so um, the notion of a zero error code, um, um, we, we came up with um, the idea, we, the first thing we did is we proved that if the probability of error was equal to zero, then we have no uncertainty. And in that case, we can always, we can show very, very easily that R is less than equal to C, less than C, actually. Um, or equal. I mean, it depends. But the point is that we have this bound, which is very easy to show. And that was a sort of a good precursor to the actual proof where, and in some sense, this is, the, this is the actual proof that says that if the error is driven to zero, then the rate goes to, the rate must be less than C. And, and in this proof, we used Fano's inequality in this step. 
Okay, so we get that nr is less than or equal to um, this stuff, and all this other stuff is going to zero. And then um, this finally then gave us this um, this famous picture, which um, I mean again, this is another sort of point to um, point to sort of stress, which is that it was thought at at the time that it was reasonable maybe for it for the picture to look like this, right? So that. If you wanted to have a zero probability of error, you had to communicate at a rate of zero. Right? For example, remember the repetition code. The repetition code, you can drive the probability of error down arbitrarily closely to zero, but at the same time, you were driving the rate down arbitrarily to zero. And the, and the revolutionary idea was that C is not at zero. C, in fact, is at C. In which it depends on the channel. So what do you think? Clear? Okay. What about those YouTubers, the, the YouTube watchers? It's strange to be here after a couple of lectures of, not, of watching on YouTube, isn't it? I don't know what's better. What's the better experience? Maybe YouTube. Because you can fast forward me. Or, or slow me down. Doesn't you doesn't YouTube have like twice half speed and double speed or one point five speed? Does it? Sorry. And you on all the technical difficulties. That's true. That's right. The technical difficulties, the bad jokes are gone. Everything's gone except for the. the I'm sorry. No, no, I don't have edit out the jokes. I should edit out the jokes. I'm sure that people would greatly appreciate filtering of all the bad jokes out. But it, it, would, it would actually take too much time. I would need a bad joke detector. I'd need to go through every, every single lecture, listen to one. Oh, that's a bad joke. Get rid of that. That's a bad joke. Um, Software is not up to, up to par yet. That's a research topic. If anyone wants to work on bad joke detection, this is great training material. Um, OK, so then this, this slide here is on feedback. And what we showed here, which you know, on the one hand, when you really think about it, maybe, maybe it makes complete sense. But at first, you might think, if you don't think about it really, that, well, feedback should help. And here we showed, well, feedback doesn't help. We can't increase the capacity uh, with, with using perfect feedback. Because in some sense, once we're encoding, once we're coding at the capacity, we already know everything about the channel that can be exploited. And getting feedback doesn't really tell us anything we don't know. Although getting feedback can significantly help the coding and decoding procedure. So if there's feedback, you can, you can coordinate much more easily. And coding and decoding might be computationally cheaper, but it doesn't actually help in terms of the total, the actual rate, the possible rates of communication. OK, so uh, any questions on the old stuff, on the review? Okay, so now what we're going to do is, is sort of talk about this joint source channel coding theorem. And this is also um, an idea that was seen as uh, somewhat revolutionary, I think, which was that the channel could be used for lots of different types of source material, independent of the kind of source material. And, and that what one could do, which um, you know, might seem you know, almost banal or, or mundane or today, but what one can do is uh, have separate entropy compressors, which compresses sources of different types, like one might be an audio, one might be video, one might be something else, one might be text. You can have separate entry compressors, each of which is, is customized to a particular type of source, and then once you've entropy compressed things, then um, you, then you send it over a channel using the channel coder. And it, the channel coder doesn't care. It just says, it's a string of bits. I'm just going to get these bits over there. And if it's entry, entry compressed. And so the question is, well, what about the rate? What about the communicating an information source that has entropy rate H over a channel that has capacity C? So the question is, can we glue these things together? And And it's... It's not. It's something that needs to be shown. 
So what data compression, in the data compression world, we said was that you know, we can take a source uh, and then we can get error-free compression as long as we compress down to a rate r, remember, which is no less than the entropy of the source. And the rate in this case is in units of bits per source symbol on average. Like how many bits are you using to encode each source symbol on average over long blocks? And then that's data compression. And the data transmission says that we can achieve error-free transmission as long as it's the case that we're not trying to communicate at a rate greater than the fundamental capacity of the channel. And in this particular case, the rate is measured in units of bits per, per channel use. So maybe we can glue these things together, like the bits per source symbol and the bits per channel use. If the, num if the same number of bits, if the sum number of bits per source symbol is less than the number of bits per channel use, we should be able to send those bits through. And maybe if these things were matched, we should be able to communicate uh, perfectly. Um, so that's the question. If it's the case that the entropy of the source that we're trying to send is less than the capacity of the channel, then does that mean we can send that source over, over a channel with you know, vanishing probability of error as the block length gets big? And that's what this joint um, channel theorem says and that what, what we formalize. Because it's certainly a reasonable assumption. And, and, and so, but we need to prove it. So this is what we're going to do here. So here's the actual process. So we, um, we compress the source down to its entropy using Huffman or, or whatever method, Lempel-Zev, which we're going to talk about. Arithmetic, these are the ones we talked about this quarter, Huffman and arithmetic. We're going to talk about this one, Lempel-Zev, next quarter, which is a really important one. That's a, that's a universal source code that, strangely enough, it's, it's an algorithmic compression scheme using pointers and string matching that you can magically show compresses down to the entropy rate which is a, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing proof, which I strongly encourage you to visit. Maybe. What is the word universal in the first one? So universal basically is the idea that, remember, we talked about this in, in, when we were talking about compression, but the, the idea of universal source coding is the idea that you can build a source coder for um, any source as long as you, you know its entropy. So, so it, in other words, it doesn't really depend on a distribution. Like, like for example, Huffman coding isn't really considered a universal source coding because it really depends on the distribution. You need to use the distribution in order to actually get down to the entropy rate. The universal source coding says, well, here's this scheme. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compress that down to its entry P rate without actually explicitly using the probability distribution associated with it. And um, you know, typical set theory is sort of like that. It's sort of, I mean, it's not a practically realizable universal source coder, but it sort of says, well, I'm only going to use a bit string associated with an index of all of the typical sets. And anything that's not typical, I'm just going to toss. I'm going to get an error. I'm not even going to have a bit string associated with that, with the non-typical non set. And the error goes down to zero, and that's sort of, in some sense, universal. Um, Lempel-Z is the universal source coder, because it doesn't estimate the probability of distribution. It does, it, it's an algorithm that basically just says, oh, I've seen that string before. Rather than sending that string, I'm just going to say send a pointer to somewhere into my history, which gives that string. And you just keep sending these pointers into your history. So when you're when you're decoding, you're saying, oh, I've seen that string. Repeat that string. Repeat that string. Oh, here's a little bit of new stuff. And so then it's only the new stuff that you actually explicitly represent. The rest of it is just you're sending pointers back into your history. And Lempel Z is a, it's a, it's an amazing algorithm, and it's a, and the proof that it is universal, meaning that it compresses down the entropy without actually explicitly using the distribution in any sense, is, is also an amazing proof. I mean, it's, it's very surprising um, that you can do that. Um, we're also going to talk also about Kamago complexity, which is another different, another measure of, of complexity, which is, um, which is really interesting. We, that gets very philosophical. I, that, th this is an advertisement for next quarter. I think I might have mentioned this, but it's, We'll talk about the number omega. Did I, did I mention this in this class? So the number omega is a, it's a number that if you knew, it's a number between 0 and 1. And if you knew this number, you could answer any question in, in the universe. It's the oracle number. Um, and it's a, it's a number that exists. You can prove that it, it exists, and it proves it's between 0 and 1. But uh, if you had it, you could answer any question. So if you want to find out about omega, 
you want to compute the first few digits of omega, and maybe like ask simple questions like, is it raining in Seattle? That's a, those are easy questions to ask, but much more fundamental questions like, how do you solve world hunger? It has the answer. Is there life on Mars? Or is there life in the Milky Way galaxy? Those are, those are trivial questions for this number to answer. But it, come, come next quarter, and you'll, you'll find out about that number. Um, anyway, so what we're doing, so we compress the source down to its entropy. We transmit it over a channel, right, somehow using a channel encoder. And um, all sources, ideally, would be able to share the same channel. Like, nowadays, we use TCP IP to send music and video and email and spam and um, Facebook messages. I don't know, all, all, everything, right? It's all, it's all using the same underlying channel. And um, then perhaps, I mean, this is the idea that, that was not obvious at the time. The same channel coding scheme could be used regardless of the source. If it's the case that the source is first compressed down to the entropy, and the channel encoder and decoder process doesn't need, in some sense, to know anything about where the source came from. It just basically says, I don't care what it is, it's just a stream of bits, and I'm going to encode it. And so remember this picture. We started from a source here. And we, we, we do a source coder, which is like a compressor, a channel encoder. We send it over a channel, which has noise, and then we decode the, the channel, and then decode the source. And then we have a receiver, and that, that process of being able to sort of separate out the source coder and the source decoder and the channel encoder and the channel decoder is what we're really talking about. And again, this was a revolutionary idea in the 1940s. It was always thought that, well, you know, if you're sending telegraph signals, you need to do one thing. If you're sending radio signals, you need to do something else. And TV was beginning to be looked at in serious ways. And you know, maybe if you're doing FM versus AM transmission, you need to do something totally different than the channel encoding method. You need to encode FM and AM differently. And, and here Shannon came along and said, no, not really. You don't need to. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the idea of AEP. So AEP is fundamental. right? We're using this a lot. Um, asymptotic equipetition property. And so let's say we've got some something that satisfies an AEP property, and we could assume that it's stationary and exotic. Like, for example, let's say that we have um, a mark, uh, some sort of stochastic process, V, and V is a, is a series of messages we want to send. And let's say that there's some, it's, it's measurable in terms of an entropy rate. So we could assume it's stationary or ergodic, or it's locally stationary or ergodic. And on average, we, we see H of V bits per source symbol used. And that's not, it's, it could be IID, in which case H of V is equal to H of each individual random variable, but there could be some dependence as well. But this is the average amount of information that's sent per, or, or inf information that exists per symbol. And we're, we're talking about a block of length n of them. Okay. So we've got a block of length n. And we, we send it to an encoder, which, which maps it to n channel input symbols, which then, thanks to the noise problem of the channel, uh, makes it, uh, we get n output symbols, and then we have a decoder, which is a decoded version of the message, the original message. And we have a probability of error, which basically is summing up all, over all possible um, outputs. So, um, so we're summing over, um, I'm not sure if you can see that, but we're summing over all y and v. Um, y is the output. Um, and it's a, it's, these are the random variables, right? So it's all possible inputs and all possible outputs. So this is an indicator of, of that, that what was decoded is not the same as what was sent. So in overall indications that, that there's an error, what's the probability of that happening? And that corresponds to the probability of sending this thing and the probability of receiving the corresponding y. So the probability of sending the v, v1 through n, and then the probability of receiving through the channel the corresponding string of length n of out, channel output symbols. 
since they're probability bare. And then notice that the probability bare is now, it's, you say, well, wait, wait a second, is this any different than what we talked about before? What is the difference? So the, there is a difference in that now we're talking about the error not in terms of an x being um, not being decoded properly. We're talking about the original message, the b. Because before what was happening is like we turned b into a sense of channel symbol, and we talked about the error in terms of x gets sent to y, and then we decode y to x, and we get an error when there's an x and y. But now we have this additional process going on, which is this encoder thing, which goes from b to x which we have to deal with. And so we're talking about an error in terms of not getting back our, our original message, which is B. So that's the difference. I mean, it looks the same. It's the same form. And of course, we're going to be able to show the same result, but, but um, you know, there is a difference. So the theorem says that, that if there's an asymptotic equipetition property associated with the source, then there exists a sequence of um, to the NRN codes with vanishing probability of error if, now here's the big if, if um, not the rate of information we're sending lies below the capacity, but instead is if the entropy of the source is below the capacity. So in other words, the condition is now that the entropy of the source has to be below the capacity. So that's sufficient for there being a vanishing probability of their sequence of codes. And then conversely, if it's the case that um, the entropy is greater than the um, capacity, then the probability of error is bounded away from zero for all n. So that's, that's the same way of saying that if, you know, that we're, we're doing the converse, we're, we're sort of doing the contrapositive of a converse, but basically this is the same, it's the same converse, just written slightly differently. Any questions about the statement of the theorem? Yep. Does this mean that you cannot compress the entropy in the Well, it says, for example, if you've got an entropy, if you've got a source that's entropy H of V, and let's say that you use the wrong distribution, so you compress it at H of V plus the KL divergence between you know, P and Q or something, and if that happens, if that, if that, um, if you've done that wrong then you won't be able to communicate because you know the 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 compression rate the number of bits per channel symbol is now h plus d which is bigger than the capacity you won't be, and that, so that means that you would be trying to use too many bits per channel but if you if you can get h plus d to be below the capacity then you can do it so you're assuming extreme uh, something like this i mean why not just compress it and then transmit it and so well, that, that's the same thing, right? All I'm saying is that you, I mean, th what we're doing is we're, we're doing this together. We're doing the compression and the transmission simultaneously, or, or, or in a stage, I should say. So that encode the uh, the source uh, compressor and then the channel encoder? Yeah, it, it, it would in, in practice, yes. But, but what we're saying, the, this, the difference in this theorem is that now, before when we talked about the channel coding theorem, we said, we just talked about a rate, right? We're saying if the rate is below the capacity, we can do it for that error. And if the rate is greater than capacity, we can't. Now we're talking about in terms of the entropy of the source. Now we're saying if we have some source, V, with entropy less than the capacity, we can communicate. And if it's not less than the capacity, we can't. Okay, so that's what that means. So it's a, it's a slight difference. And, and I guess it's a little bit... I mean, I guess that, that what it's hard to... This is one of these instances where it's hard to imagine how this couldn't be the case in today's world, but we're, we have the benefit of 60, 70 years of just conceptual and cultural hindsight. And, you know, whenever you look back, like, think about Newtonian physics. You know, before people understood Newtonian physics, I think people thought of the world very, very differently, the way, you know, we, we learn about Newtonian physics in, when we're 12, in you know, these days. And, um, but, you know, in the days before these ideas were known, the whole it, the whole world was sort of thought of very very differently. Like you know, just the, the idea of a falling a falling object or throwing a ball, or the Earth, you know, circling the sun. 
and all of these sort of ideas we sort of take for granted now. And I think this is an example of that idea that the idea, you can say, well, of course, it's compressed down to the entropy rate and then you send it over a channel. At that point, it wasn't thought that that would be possible. At that point, like I was saying before, I thought that every, every type of, of, of signal would need to have its own sort of mechanism for transmission, like, like AM versus FM. But if we change the uh, algorithm as it gets binary without doing any compression, we still can't communicate, right? Um, if, if you have a source and we don't do any compression and, um, and it's, um, you're saying, can we still communicate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not if, because you remember, so, so how many bits per channel use would that be? So let's look at the, the the, um, the efficiency, because there's an underlying efficiency of a representation before and after compression, right? So, like, let's take, let's make a very, a very example, example, like a concrete example, like English characters, which you know you can compress down to about 1.2 bit per character or something like that. You know, if you use a long, you know, if you use a very good compression scheme. So, whereas when you send English, you're sending eight bits per character. So let's say that you have a channel. That can that has a capacity of 1.5 bits per channel use. So if now, if you're trying to send 8 bits per, per character to a channel that has 1.5 a capacity of 1.5, no, you're going to get errors. So you have to compress so you're first. Sending an online uh, source, right? Like an offline source, it's going to be sending slower there. I think this is this is this is independent of whether it's online or offline, because um, I mean, if you if you do pre-compression, I'm just saying that you have to compress first to something down to its entropy, or at least something that has a rate which is less than the capacity of the channel. If, you, if your rate is greater than the capacity of the channel, you cannot communicate. So it's, it's separate from online versus offline. This is not an online-offline issue. This is a matter of whether or not the rate you're compressing. And we know that the rate can go, you know, we can get the rate arbitrary close to the entropy, and we know that is, if the entropy is less, is strictly less, if the entropy is strictly less to then, um, like let's let's make these relationships clear. We have the entropy here, the capacity here, and this is less than this. This is strictly less than this. So then we, that means that there exists an epsilon such that h is strictly less than h plus epsilon, which is strictly less than the capacity. And if this is our rate, we can do it. We're in great shape. But all what you need is this relationship: is that the entropy is less than the capacity strictly. That's the condition. Um, um, but, but what if H is, uh, I mean, sh shouldn't you take the floor of C to actually get the actual number of bits that you can actually communicate? The floor? The, the floor function of C. You mean to, to get integer? Yeah. No, no, remember, remember we can talk about fractional rates because we're talking about big block lengths. Right, so these are, these are average number of bits for channel use in the case of channel communication, or average number of bits per source symbol in the case of compression. So it's not like every symbol, remember, if we do like a symbol code, a simple symbol code, we, that's not going to work. We might have to use big block lengths, and we might have to use a very big block length. But the point is that the theorem states that if h is less than c, then the error will die down exponentially fast as a function of the block length increasing. It doesn't mean that if you use a block length of 3,000, it will work. You might need to use a block length of 6,000 before you, you meet your tolerance. You know, it's you as an applications person, or anybody as an applications person who wants to use this kind of stuff, says, OK, well, I'm only willing to accept a probability of error of 10 to the negative 50 or something, or whatever your probability of error is. And then that would then determine maybe a block length for a given coding scheme. But it's not like, it's not like uh, C or, or H or R have to be integer values. No. But then we'd be in trouble. I think, I think I see where the confusion is. I think, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, can't you just chop the alphabet into a bunch of chunks and, and use a smaller alphabet so that the entropy is taken short? I think no. where you're thinking is like, if you have a signal that you know is very redundant and you want to communicate it, and you're like, oh, forget it, I'm not going to compress it, I just want to. Thinking that it'll go through without error as long as I send a slower 
that when you're thinking, it, it should appear anyway. Yes. It's in this world. Thank you. Yes. But I think the idea is right that if it's um, uncompressed, then the signal's longer. So because you're using the channel more times, there's more probability of an error. Yeah, I think the, the way to think about it is don't think about it in terms of absolute time if you're thinking about slower or faster. Our, our rates are not rates in terms of like cycles per second. Our rates are bits per source symbol. Like we've got, we've got a text which has 100 characters in it. That means that there are 100 source symbols. And how many bits for each source symbol? That's one rate. Versus we have a channel and we can send some information over a channel. And how many times do we use the channel? And then how many true information bits per channel do we get? That's another, that's another rate. So we're, our rates are not like bits per unit time. So it's not like we can slow down a source or something like that. Because that, that's not how we're measuring yeah, but, rates. But, but wouldn't that be assuming that you have to encode each alphabet um, differently in order to get the channel we want? You're saying you have to encode each alphabet using the channel we want? Yes. No. <laughs> we wouldn't have to do that. I mean, but, but then can't you? No. It's, I, I, it's maybe you come see me in office hours. Okay. I mean, office hours are there for you. Uh, I encourage people to come. There's office hours after this class. Please come and see me. Please do. I mean, honestly, this this is stuff, definitely something we should talk about. So. Um, okay. So um, source channel coding theorem. So let's let's try to prove it. Um, so. Our source satisfies the asymptotic equal partition property, so that basically means there's a typical set. And it has all of the nice properties of the typical set. This is really, this is really a proof sketch, so I, I'm not going to go through the proof in this detail, because the proof is very, very similar to what we've already seen before in a number of contexts. And so since, since there's a typical set, we only bother to encode the typical set, and we only need to index the typical set, which basically means we need the entropy number of bits. Per, per source symbol, and so um, and there's an error if we don't if we don't hit the typical set, and the error is, is epsilon, right? Because epsilon is the probability that it's atypical, which can be made as small as we want, and so we have a contribution, an additive contribution of epsilon to the probability of error so far. And here's our index set. So this is the number of bits we need, right? And so now we have a rate um, of h plus epsilon. And so here's our initial rate. And um, if r is less than the capacity, which is very similar to what we just said, so then um, we can um, make um, We can make the error, well, essentially, what it's saying is that if the entropy is less than the capacity, then we can make r also less than the capacity because the epsilon can be made as small as we want. That's basically what this means. And now, the probability of error is basically a contribution. Again, this is, this is using a union bound like argument. So first of all, there's the probability of atypicality, which is here, which we know that to be epsilon. And then, then secondly, there's the probability of um, not getting the right thing. Suppose we are typical and just making an error. And because the rate is less than capacity strictly, that's also going to be less than epsilon. So the whole thing is going to have a probability of error to epsilon. And so and then we can make that as small as we want in, for, for growing clock length. So that's basically the first part of the theorem. So again, it's basically similar to what we've already saw and seen before. And then the converse is, if if the probability of error goes to zero, then the eight, then the entropy has to be less than the capacity. Um, here's our encoder and our decoder. So now, so the difference between what we saw before is that the encoder is based on a sequence of source messages to to the channel symbols, and the decoder goes back to the source symbol. And now we had a FANO. We're going to have to use a version of FANO before, but we're going to use a combination of FANO and the data processing inequality to allow us to get this. Because you know everything in some sense is a markup chain, going from the source message to the input to the channel 
to the output to the channel to the received version of the source message. That's a Markov chain. And so we need a version of, um, of, of um, Fano that, that bounds this probability of error here. Okay. So then um, what we can then get is that this, from a version of Fano, we can get that this is equal to, this is less than or equal to 1 plus n times the probability log of uh, the number of um, possible source messages, which is v to the n. And so we get the following derivation. So we've got h of v, which is less than, this is the, um, the entropy rate. And this is one of our entropy rate bounds, which is just writing it in a different way. This is using the definition of the entropy. So entropy is the sum of conditional entropy plus mutual information. This is exactly what we did in the previous two proofs. Um, <clears throat> we use uh, Fano in one case. So we use Fano's inequality to get this part here. And um, to get to go from here to here, we use the data processing inequality. So here what's happening is like we're sort of using it like we have v to x to y to v hat. So this is saying that the information between v and v hat is less than or equal to the information between x and y. So they're sort of getting closer. So in general, when you have a Markov chain, the mutual information between symbols can only get bigger as you're moving closer and closer in the Markov chain. These are random variables. And they can only get farther and farther as you're moving farther apart. So we're moving, in some sense, we're using um, the, information, the data processing inequality twice, once here and once there. And so we get that down. Um, capacity, that's doing the capacity optimization. We go from here to here. And also the channel memories, memory list property. And then we know that one, of the, 1 over n goes to 0, then gets big, and the probability of error goes to 0. So what we're left with then is that the entropy is less than or equal to the capacity. Okay, and can be made arbitrarily close as n gets big. Okay, so what, what, is, what is really different? And what's different is that we use a slightly different version of Fano. Fano's inequality right here. And we used a slightly different version of the data processing inequality. Well, it, we use the data processing inequality twice in some sense. But other than that, it's actually the same proof. So maybe the proof being so similar is not surprising because intuitively it seems like this should be the case. Okay, so um, let's take a break now because now we're going to start talking about coding. I want to, so we're going to talk, the rest of the light, today's lecture is going to be talking about coding. We're not going to have a chance to talk a lot about coding, but Shannon basically gave us an existence proof for such codes, but he didn't give us in the 1940s an ability to find them. So we're going to start talking a little, about, a little bit about ways to produce codes that, that maybe have good rates. Um, so let's take a break. OK, so we're back. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about coding now. And um, so like I said before the break, that Shannon um, said that there was, gave us an existence of a code, but he didn't, but he didn't give us a code. Um, and he didn't give us very much insight on how to find one, at least in those theorems, in, those, in the 1940s work. Um, typical set decoding is, is great mathematically and theoretically, but it's just not practical because it involves all sorts of other issues, like, for example, exponentially large sized blocks. Like when we use a, you know, the, the block is growing in n, but the, the, the content of the block, you know, the typical set is growing exponentially large. And so just, for example, detecting what's typical and what's not typical, or indexing the set of typical sets is not, not feasible. And here's the, it's an exponentially large set. Um, but um, basically, what we're going to do is talk about codes and coding. And the idea is to sort of add redundancy. Like, compression is a form of re removing redundancy. And channel coding is a form of adding redundancy. And you might think, well, why would we, why would we take a source that has redundancy in it 
we move it by compressing it so that it has no redundancy, and then add it back in before we send it out to the channel. Why not just send the signal directly? That's right, that's exactly right. So speech, for example, has an enormous amount of redundancy in it. Right? When we're speaking, uh, you know, speech is very, very compressible. And the reason for the redundancy in speech is because of our channel, which is the acoustics, the acoustic air wave, waves where, where we live, you know, our, our atmosphere and the kinds of noise that, that exists in our environment. And we have mechanisms to add additional redundancy to speech. There's a type of speech called Lombard speech, which is when it gets noisy, people tend to talk like this and elongate the vowels and be very, very loud. And that's a form of redundancy. Uh, but that doesn't really work very well when you're over a, a, an analog communications channel or when you're a bit string. That kind of redundancy is not a particularly useful redundancy to, on the receiver end, um, decode the message, nor is it particularly efficient. It's not necessarily a good, a good redundancy because it might be redundant, but it might not be easy to decode or might not be, able, be easy to see the, see the redundancy. Redundancy needs to be catered towards the types of channel and types of noise you're likely to encounter in a channel. And so, so, all right, so what about other, before we talk about that, let's talk about other physical solutions to improve coding. So, you know, like we talked about a binary symmetric channel with crossover probability P. So one way of improving the channel is just to decrease P, you know, decrease the channel, the error decreases that there's an error in the channel. And so one way of doing that is that we could re use much more expensive and reliable analog circuits. You know, rather than buying your resistors at Radio Shack, you might buy them at, <laughs> you know, somewhere, somewhere where the tolerance is, is, is much, much uh, tighter. Um, you could also improve the environment, like you could get very expensive cooling equipment and re remove thermal things, or you might have a very, very expensive lab which has very very few dust particles, and so the, the quality control of your product is, is much higher. Um, or you might actually use um, more physical area or volume for each bit. That's sort of the repetition code idea. Uh, another, another thing you do is just transmit at a higher power. So when we talk about the Gaussian channel, we're going to talk about, we're going to see how the capacity of the Gaussian channel is related to the signal to noise ratio. Now, a higher power transmitter uses more energy. Uh, and that costs more. Right? So you're always going to pay. You, know, you can do it, but you, you have to pay. And more, you, more energy contributes to global warming, and there's all sorts of bad stuff. You know, there's also heat and, and everything that are associated with that. These aren't really information theory solutions. What we want is really an information theory solution to, to coding. And so we saw repetition codes, how repetition code was an example. And so the idea is that when we want to send a string, x1 through xk, we repeat each symbol redundantly. And um, you remember the noisy, do you remember that example when we talked about you know, speaking over a noisy AM radio and if we repeat each word multiple times, we're guaranteed that you know, the probability of error is going to decrease. But, um, and the message becomes the following where you know, we repeat x1 k times and then we repeat x2 k times and so on and so forth. But, uh, the error goes to zero, as we said. Um, and then, how would we decode? Like, so, so I mean, a, a very simple way of doing this is just to take the take a majority vote. So it, it's a voting scheme. It, it's an election. So basically, at the receiver end, what the decoder does is it just holds an election, and everybody, every symbol gets to vote, like for each block, and every and whoever. You know, it's a plurality based voting scheme, and the, and the winner is is the one who gets uh, the uh, Gets to you know the, the 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 symbol that has the most votes gets is the one that's decoded and that actually has a, a vanishing probability of error. Uh, but the bad thing is that the rate it goes down to zero as one over k. So that's an example of the old style. So pre nineteen forty eight way of thinking. And we want post nineteen we want a modern post nineteen forty eight way of thinking. Um, so here's an idea, here's another idea. So, we, so let's say, this is from uh, David Mackay's text, by the way. He had a very nice example that I wanted to include. Uh, so let's say that we send this message, S, which consists of 
seven bits. Okay. Now, it's a repetition code. So what, what this means is the following. So these are the seven bits that we send. Right. So we send the seven bits, and then we do a repetition code. So what actually gets sent are each one of those bits repeated three times. Okay. Now, some number of those bits gets corrupted, and so this is we have a noise vector. And so what this is, is this is just a binary vector that corresponds to whenever there's a noise. So for example, like this guy here, I'm going to circle all the bits that are noisy. Right? So anytime there's a yellow circled one, that corresponds to noise. And so what we get, what gets received is um, this. So in this case, we, what gets received is 0, 0, 0, which is the same thing that we sent because there's no noise. Here we get 0, 0, 1 because there's one noise bit. Here we get 1, 1, 1. This is fine. Here we get something that's, which is very different than what we sent. There are two, two noise bits. And so they, rather, what we sent was 111, one, one, and we get 010. Zero, zero. Here we get the same thing. Here we get the same thing. Right. So here's another scenario. Uh, let's, let's make this a little bit more explicit. So again, we, um, these are the sent. These are the things we want to send. We repeat it each bit three times. We have some noise. It gets added, you know, noise is due to the channel. And so what gets received is this. And let's say that we do a majority vote. So the majority vote then ends up being this. So this is 0, 0, 0, so the majority is 0. This is 0, 0, 1, so the majority is 1. And this is basically, there was an error, but it was a corrected error. So we, we corrected the error because it just so happens that the majority is in the right. Because there's only one, no, one noise bit added. Here, we, we have all the same, so the majority is correct. There's no error. The majority is correct here. But what happens in this case? So in this particular case, it's not a correct, it's, it's a, um, it's an uncorrected error. Now, now things we can detect that there's an error. Why can we detect that there's an error? Sorry? Right, because it's a combination of zero ones. We know that basically every code word in this coding scheme has to consist of a sequence of either all zeros or a sequence of all ones. So there's a difference between error detection and error correction. You know, in the best of cases, we would like to be able to do both error detection and correction automatically. Error, de error detection is better than nothing, though, because if, if there's an error detected, you can send a message back saying, sorry, what did you say, or please retransmit. I mean, people do that all the time. We know when we don't understand something, hopefully, <laughs> and we ask, sorry, what did you mean, or what did you say, or could you say that again, or I was spacing out for a minute, can you please ask to say that again, or sorry, I was, the, the, the bus just drove by, could you please say that again, I didn't hear. You know, so we have error detection, um, we also have error correction, where we make assumptions about what you say, or what each other says, I should say, and fill in the gaps. In fact, human communication is, is filled with error correction, and it's amazing that that happens all the time, and also leads to misunderstanding all the time. It's one of the reasons why people start wars, is because of faulty error correction. Um, it would be much better if we could just do error detection, I guess, in that sense. But the point is that what we'd like in actual digital communication is, is, is the ability to correct and detect error. So here's an example where you can only detect but can't correct the error. So you get the error and you know that there's an error, but there's nothing you can do. Right? We don't know what was sent. Because it could have been anything. We could have sent, this could have been, um, um, you know, uh, zero um, something else, and we would have had a had the same received string. So lastly, uh, in this in this guy here, there's no error, and there's no error there. So now this is a repetition code, and it has the property that we can correct one bit errors, but we can't correct two bit errors. We can detect two bit errors. 
What if there's three bit errors? Then we don't even detect. You know, if 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 we send one 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 and all three of those bits are in error, we get zero zero zero. We will happily decode zero and be completely unaware that we've made a wrong decision. And for any probability, like if if the binary if you're using a binary symmetric channel with crossover probability p of point, you know one, then there's a one in a thousand chance that we're going to get three errors in a row, right? Which, when we're sending millions and millions of bits, is probably going to happen pretty often. So therefore, this is not a good code. So what, then we could say, okay, well, what if what if we go to a repetition code with four or five or six and so on and so forth? So then, what happens is that your rate of the code decreases, or the time you have to wait before it gets re gets there is multiplied by k, right? So that's that's another way you can think about it. Get going back to this discussion, but um, and so that means that. Your email doesn't get there on Tuesday; it gets there next Tuesday, or, or, or next next March. Um, okay, but let's let's now talk a little bit about parity check codes. Now, parity check codes are sort of the basis of all modern coding schemes, and in fact, the low density parity check code (LDPC) is basically a, a form of parity check code which has sort of sparse random parity checks interspersed all over the place. Um, we're going to talk about a very simple one, the Hammond code. Um, but here's the idea of a parity check code. So we've got a binary input and output alphabet. So we're sending bits and receiving bits. We have a block size. So the block is the number of actual information bits that we want to send. And the block size is going to be length n minus 1. Okay. And the nth bit is not going to be a real information bit, but it's going to be a parity. It's going to be say, basically saying it's going to be a function of the preceding n minus 1 bits that's going to be an indicator of whether or not there is an odd number of bits. So what it does is it basically sums up all of the bits here and then takes mod 2. So if there's an odd number of bits, we get a 1. And if there's an even number of bits, we get a 0. So this is this is the parity bit here, this guy, right? So it's just an indicator of there being an odd number of bits on in the preceding n minus one bits. Okay. So therefore, um, a necessary but not sufficient condition for a valid code word is that when you sum up all n bits, not just the first n minus 1, but when you sum up all n bits, it has to be even. It has to be an even number of bits. Or in other words, the sum of the number of bits mod 2 has to be 0. Why? Well, if there's an odd number of bits, then the parity is on, and so that means that there's going to be an even number of bits when you consider all n. And if there's an even number of bits, then the parity is going to be off, and the parity, so so that means it's going to be even. So it's an even in, in, in any case. So it basically means that code words are only even numbers of bits, valid code words. So any instance of um, of if there are errors, like let's say that, let's say we're interested in doing error error detection. So we send this thing over a channel and get a received code word, and let's say that there's some errors. And anytime there's an even, there's a um, an odd number of errors. Um, will it will it uh, pass this condition? It won't, because if there's an odd number of errors, that means that one one if if one bit is is switched is swapped, or you know if, if a bit goes from a zero to a one, then all of a sudden the code word has an odd number of ones in it. Or if a, if a bit goes from a one to a zero, all of a sudden, or anytime there's an odd number of changes to the bit string the parity check fails, and so therefore we can detect that there, there was an error. So it's an error, so we, right, because right? It pat, so, um, although if there's two errors, like if one zero goes to a one and another one goes to a zero, we still got an even number of bits, and we don't even detect that there was an error on the receiving side. So this is kind of a weird thing, because you might think, well, what channel would be more likely to have an odd number 
than an even number of errors. That's probably unusual. But still, that's, that's what we've got for right now. We're, of course, going to improve upon the situation. Um, so therefore, we can't correct errors. And in fact, it's, it's worse than that. It's, it's only possible to detect a, a very sort of small subset of the, of the kinds of errors we want, namely odd numbers of swaps. But on the other hand, this idea of a parity check forms the basis of many, many extremely important and modern coding techniques, including, including LDPC codes and the, the ones that we're going to talk about, Hammond codes. And, and the ideas of them are also sort of um, utilized in, in, in turbo codes, which are another. Tur turbo codes are basically two convolutional codes that have a permutation network connected between them. And, um, and the idea of these, these LDPC codes, or these sparse codes, is that they're random. And the structure of them is random. And because it's random, it's very unlikely that any channel is going to be able to sort of have a pattern of noise that's likely to sort of make the sort of random additional redundancy bits completely match the conditions of, of undetectability or uncorrectability. We'll get into the intuition of that next quarter. But right now, we just want to talk about LDPC codes and, and Hamming codes. Actually, no, L Hamming codes is what we're going to talk about. So Hamming, we're going to start, we're going to talk about next. Hamming codes was sort of the first set of codes that were really just start, we're, we're beginning to, you know, so in the 1950s, people started talking about coding, coding theory. And that Hamming was one of the earliest types of coding that people talked about. So this is called the 743 code. Um, Hamming codes are, are um, indicated by three numbers, 743 in this case. 7 is sort of the code word length. 4 is the number of um, information bits of the real signal. And 3 is the number of redundancy bits that are added per code word. So that basically means that in a 743 code, you can communicate any one of 16 messages. So again, the alphabets are binary. Um, in, a, in a having 4-3 code, since there are four information bits and three redundancy bits, the rate of the code is basically 4 over 7. So that's the number of bits per channel use that we're using. Right? Now the assumption is that the, four first, the first four bits of a code word are the information bits. So those are the things that really carry the message. Right? So we're using, to send those four bits, we're using the channel seven times. So how many, how many real bits are there? Four. How many channels are we using? Seven. So the number of bits per channel use? Four over seven. So that's and then again this issue of rate. Right? That's, that's how, do you, how we think about it. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. All right, so to send four bits, we use the channel seven times. Um, so here's, here's our four bits. Here's names from them. From them. Let's, let's just call them x0, x1, x2, and x3. It's a binary string of length 4. Um, and when we want to send those four bits, we need to use the channel seven times. So we're going to send three additional parity or redundancy bits. Now, it's not going to be the same parity. It's not going to be just this parity over four bits. It's going to be a parity um, that we're going to talk about how we're going to construct in one second. But first of all, are, is everybody familiar with mod 2 arithmetic? Raise your hand if you are. Okay, it's, you're not, our TA is not familiar with lots of it. You didn't reach, I'm just joking. Yeah. Um, so, just in case, so in mod 2, 1 plus 1 is 0, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 is equal to 0, minus 1 is equal to minus 1. So, minus 1 is equal to 1. Um, so, all of these things should be, we should be familiar with. Everything is mod 2. A couple of times I'll say mod 2, a few times I'll probably forget, but everything is really mod 2. Like for example, here we talk about mod 2. So here's our parity bits. So we have x1, x0, x1, x2, x3, and we're going to construct three additional parity bits. The first one is going to be the sum of x1, x2, x3, mod 2. The second one is going to be the sum of x0, x2, x3, mod 2. And the third is going to be this, x, x0, x1, x3, mod 2. So 
So that means that if we had this string, 0, 1, 1, 0, as our information bits, then when we plug those bits into this side of the equations, we get these bits for, for these sides of the equations. And then the complete code word would essentially be the following, would be this bit string down there. Everybody see that? Now, it turns out we can also describe this using um, a linear equation, or linear equality in particular. Um, everything, again, is mod 2, where we can write it in a number of different forms. But when we write it in this form here, it sort of looks, it's starting to look a little bit like matrix vector multiply. And in fact, um, we can write this uh, as a matrix vector multiply where h, where x, x is a vector of length 7. So there's x, which is a vector of length 7. And then we have this vector, or sorry, this matrix, h. And then the equation that we wrote is, that, that we had in the previous slide is just this, hx equals to 0. So this thing here, this equation here, corresponds exactly to this equation here. Is that right? Let's see. Yep. So therefore the code words, you know, the code words are the solution space to, to, to this equation. And moreover, they lie in the null space of H, you know, in, in mod, mod 2 arithmetic. So now, the thing to note about H is the following. So H is a column permutation of all seven non-zero length three column vectors. So zero, to think about all of the column vectors, um, zero, zero, zero is not there, right? So that's a zero column vector, but we've got um, zero, zero, one, uh, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, I mean, I don't know. Do I need to do this? One zero one, one one zero. I'm already screwing this up. And anyway, they're all seven. They're all there, right? So you try doing this live someday, in front of, you know, and, you, and at the same time fretting about the wire that's going down. So anyway, they're all all seven are there, um, and it's a permutation. They're not in any particular order, but in fact they were constructed in this particular way. And the code words are defined by the null space. So, so there's two things that are important to, about this point. Maybe I should mention. First of all, is that they're non-zero. Okay. And, and number one, number two, all seven. And of course, you know they're length three. Um, since all seven, all seven implies that none are equal to each other. Right? So that's something that we need. Um, and also that they're non-zero. That's an important part, too. So we're in the null space. So, so the code words are x such that hx is equal to 0. That's the set. And since the rank of this matrix, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a 3 by 7 matrix. It's got rank 3. So from the perspective of the row space, all you know, three, three dimensions of span. And so the null space is 4. This is result in linear algebra, and the mod 2 doesn't actually change that result. And so therefore, the, the vectors that lie within this um, null space should be, we should have 16 of them, right? 2 to the 4, because it's, it's dimensionality is 4. Everybody, is everybody clear on that? And in fact, here they are. Here are the 16 vectors in the null space. Um, Now, I'm not going to read them to you, but I will tell you a joke. This is a joke I tell every quarter, so I, I apologize. You, I, don't, I think, Scott, you probably heard this before, but this is a joke about my undergraduate digital design class when I was at Berkeley. And I had a 
professor, he wasn't a professor, he was a postdoc visiting lecturer or something, and it was about digital design. And he used to, back in those days, we talk about like, when you didn't want to design this as a digital circuit, you just use a big ROM. And so he would write, he would literally, this was in the days of whiteboard or blackboards, he would write like a 64 by 128 ROM on the whiteboard, and he would write down all 64 by 128 binary digits, and he would be writing down all of these digits on the board. I mean, literally the whole, he would have, it was in one of these massive rooms with like 200 undergraduates, and you know, with boards, and so like you'd start up here, and then this whole thing would it would take like half an hour to write down this wrong. And I would always fall asleep. I was always the person falling, just like you guys are doing in my class. I guess this is this is just this is just desserts, right? So I was in the back falling asleep because I just thought writing these these ridiculous things to do. But he would diligently be writing down it. But then there's always one student in the front of the class who would he would they would get like. You know, he, he would be at his like 4,766th digit, and he would say, sorry, isn't that supposed to be a one? And, <laughs> and, and he would look and say, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. And he would correct the zero to one, and then I, I would sort of wake up and say, oh, yeah, whatever. But anyway, so that, ever since then, whenever I get to a point where I've got lots of zeros and ones, I always tell this story. And, and as in a result, don't, I, I don't read them. But I have to tell you, though, um, just this morning, I found a very important typo. I found an error in this. There was a zero that should have been a one. I fixed it. Um, so that way, first of all, we don't have anybody sitting in the front row. So there's nobody sitting in the front row to correct these zero and one errors. And secondly, there's no errors. So there's nothing to correct. At least there's no, there's no known errors here. But in any event, these are the null, these are the null space vectors. Actually, here's, here's another joke. So I told this, this story once before, and I mentioned the, the person's name who had written this big wrong, and one of the students in class, I said, oh, I know him. He's my uncle. And I go, <laughs> <laughs> and I really made him do this. Please don't tell him I said that. So, um, actually, I don't know what he's doing. But. So does this word code apply to all the, all the variations of the same code, or these are well, we're, we're going to, you're right that this is a code. We don't know that yet. But, but, but this is going to be the code. And each one of these are going to be the code words. But why are the code words? We'll see in a minute. But these are the, these are the, these are the, well, we should, I guess it's maybe obvious why it's the code words. Right? Because these are, this is the null space of hx is equal to zero, right? And so these are all of the code words that satisfy all three parity conditions, right? Because remember, so the parity conditions are encoded in this matrix. And, and notice that um, the first four bits range over all possible information words that we might want to send. I mean, so we've got, you know, this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on and so forth. So the first four bits just counts from 0 up to 16, or up to, up to 15. It's only for one matrix, one single matrix. Yeah, this is only one H. It's only one H. So those first four bits, then, you know, we, so for example, what we could do already, you know, since these are, these are the strings that satisfy the parity condition, this is the null space. So let's say that we, if we decide that what we want to send is, say, let's say we decide we want to send uh, 1010, we could look this up, or at least find find the solution. And, and there's there's essentially a set of um, parity bits corresponding to that. And so the, our code word would essentially be this. A code word for one zero one zero would be that one zero one zero one zero one. Okay, but. You know, we, this is for this is associated with this particular H, which is a particular seven four three code, seven four three Hammond code. So we're just, we're doing Hammond codes by just giving you an example. Basically, we're not studying them in, in its full glory. Like I said, I mean, to really study Hammond codes, we need to spend several weeks just on Hammond codes. Uh, so we're just giving you an example. So the first four bits are really the data bits; these are the information bits, and the second three bits. Well, the last three bits are the are the redundancy bits or the parity bits. 
And, and then these are the code words. So like, like I said, you know, each, each one of these 16 strings is a code word. So when we want, when we want to encode a string, we append these additional parity bits onto it. That's the encoding. So that, that's kind of interesting because the actual message it's, it's very different than, say, a repetition code where every bit is repeated some number of times. Here we've got sort of three bits which are kind of representing some redundant information about the first four bits. So it's smarter than that. If we had if we'd done a repetition code where each bit is repeated k times, then the code words would be k times four. Here maybe we're doing something much more intelligent, which is we're sort of there's sort of a distributed, sort of a shared representation of the redundancy. That there's redundancy um, associated with all four bits, not just with one bit each. And that we know also that it, since any code word lies within the null space of H, maybe we can use that for decoding. And in fact, that's what we're going to do. So any code word is in the null space of H. So C is a code word. C is the set of code words. It's all X such that H X is equal to zero. Moreover, if we've got two code words, um, the sum of two code words is also a code word. Now, why is that? It's because of the linearity. Even mod two, you know, h is linear. So when we type, when we apply h to v one plus v two, that's the same as h of v one plus h of v two, which is zero plus zero, which is zero. So the sum of any two code words is a code word. That means if you take any one of these vector, any two of these vectors, sum them together. I mean, should we pick them? Should we do this? Let's, let's just choose, uh, I don't know, this one and this one, say. So when we sum them together, we're going to get uh, 1, 0, 1, one zero. I know I'm going to make a mistake on this. And 1, and then 1, 1, 1. OK, so let's, let's see if that works. Um, that didn't work. All right, what, let's forget it. I'm not going to do live <laughs> arithmetic. But if you sum any two of them together, you're going to get them. OK, let's take a difference of code words. Maybe if we do a difference, it would be better. So if we take v1 minus v2, then for the same reason, uh, the fraction of code words is going to be a code word. Maybe we should try that. Maybe if we, OK, so should we try it again? Okay, this is dangerous. OK, you help me. You guys help me. So. Um, so let's do, let's do the addition one. Okay, so the first bit is, is 1 plus 1, 1 plus 0, which is 1. Then 1 plus 1, which is 0, right? 0 plus 1, which is 1. And 1 plus 0, which is 1, right? 0 plus 1, which is 1. Things are not writing down. Let's try this again. 1 plus 0. This is, this is getting back to my undergraduate days, which is 1. And 0 plus 1, which is 1. 1 plus 0, which is 1. One plus one is one. So that's that's what I get. Um, okay, I have to I have to check this offline. I'm not sure why it's not working. But the point is, at least from the mathematical perspective, if we take any it's sum of two vectors, you're going to get a code word, right? And if we take a difference of two vectors, we get a code word. I must be making a mistake somewhere in the arithmetic. Um, Now, the other thing to note is that the minimum, minimum number of ones in any non-zero code word is three. Now, if we go to these code words, um, there's one which is all zeros, right? But notice that any of the other ones has only three, has at least three ones in it. Now, why must that be the case? And here's why. Um, first of all, this is called the weight of the code. So that in, in a, when you have a code book with a bunch of code words. Maybe one code word is all zeros, but other than that zero one, the minimum number of ones in any code word is the weight. And why is it three? Uh, for the following reason. Suppose it was the case that um, you had a weight two code word. Okay. So then, so that, that code word must lie in the null space of H. So that h times that code word is equal to zero. Right? Um, now, zero times anything is going to be equal to zero. Right? So what we're, what, what we're going to be getting is when we, take, when we do um, 
uh, when you get um, that code which has only two two ones in it times h, what essentially we're going to be doing is summing up the two corresponding row vectors in h, right? But the two corresponding row vectors are different, right? Because we said, remember, the, the code word, the code vectors, the column vectors of h are non-zero and they're all different. And if we sum two non-zero vectors, mod two, well, we're never going to get zero, right? Because there's always going to be a difference. And so therefore, the sum of any two column vectors can't be zero. And so therefore, you can't have a code word with only two bits on. It has, it has to be at least three. Um, we can't have a wait one code word also. Why is that? First of all, is this, did this explanation make sense? I can describe it again. Raise your hand if you want me to draw, draw a little picture. OK, so, so here's H. So h is this vector here. So there's one vector to this. There's uh, it's seven column vectors, right? And we're multiplying it by this code word, which purportedly has only two non-zero entries. So it's, let's say 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. OK. Transpose. Right, so it's it's the it's the it's this position these are the two non zeros in the code word, right? So that basically we're gonna then when we multiply these things together, we're going to sum together this column vector and this column vector. So those two column vectors are going to be summed together. Now, when you sum together two column vectors, because all the other all the other ones, all the other column vectors are just going to be hit by the corresponding zeros that live here. So all of these guys are all zeros. So we don't we don't sum these guys. So when we when we sum together two column vectors, these are binary vectors that are different. Is there any way we can get zero? No, because if there's different, that means you're going to get a zero or a one or a one or a zero or something's going to be different. So one of the when you sum, there's going to be some one somewhere in the sum, so therefore it can't be the null space. And there's only two differences, or there are two non-zero entries. And so the question is for you next is why can't we have a wait one code word? Yeah, that would just choose one column vector. Exactly right. In one column vector, we said it's non-zero, so it's therefore you can't have a wait one. Anything that with wait one is not in the null space. Um, can we have a wait three code word? We can, in fact, because since all seven non-zero length three vectors correspond to the columns, any two of them summed together is going to equal to the third a third one. All right, should we try this? All right, why do I do this? So let's let's try this with this with this this matrix. Okay, so let's say let's say we take this one and this one. And we add it together. So we're going to get the column vector 0, 0, 1. And hey, that worked out this time. So we're right there. I'm not, I'm not totally crazy. I still want to go back to that other example, why that didn't work. Does anyone, does anyone want to give it a try? Who wants to add together two of these vectors? What was the claim that we made? Anyone want to try it? Maybe there's still errors in this table. Okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so which one do you want to do? Let's do row index comments, so 3, comma 7. This is like Hollywood squares, right? So 3, 4, and 3 is wrong. This one's wrong. Yeah. Okay, which, what should it be? Is it a 0 or a 1? You should be sitting in the front row. <laughs> what I'm just doing. 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Yeah. 0, 0. 
You claim those should be zero, but the but the others should be okay, right? So as long as we don't deal with those, it should be okay. So that's saying that if we if we get this one and this one and we add those two up, right? Well, I guess unless the answer is this one, All right? Let's try it one more time. So zero, zero, one, one, one. The other problem is that I'm blind. So one, zero, zero. So does that exist somewhere? Yes, yes, it does. We're, we're there. Okay, great. All right, I will fix this table later, not now. But the the point is that this is, should be this should be right. Okay. Was there any intuition behind this construction? Or well, well, the intuition is that these are the parity check. I mean, we we constructed it. We can we formed these these parity bits. I mean, in some sense, the parity bit is sort of the code construction. Like, how do we construct the particular 743 thing? And we do it in a sense so that we, we do have, um, so that, so that the, uh, you know, the, the, the rank is three, obviously, and, you know. Basically, this is the distance between these. You want the distance to be, to be large. We're going to talk a little bit about the distance, but the, the way in which, and the reason for constructing these, these are, these are what we would need to study more fully, but in general, you want to construct it such that the null space is sort of uh, full in the same sense. So let's go through and um, go back here. So we can have, so basically the minimum weight is three. So there's the distance, which is your next question. Because that's, that's the bit you asked. So any code word is in the null space. Now the other thing is that how close are these code words to each other? Okay. And the code words can be seen by measuring their distance to each other. And the distance in this, turns out in this case, happens to be three. Now what that really means is that the minimum Hamming distance between any two code words is three. Now this is really important because remember also this notion of, of the, um, you know, we, we have a source and receiver and we've got the small balls fitting in the big balls and remember that picture? So if the code words here are far apart from each other, then maybe these guys are going to be well separated. You know, if there's a certain, a certain type of distortion. So in general, minimum distance, having a, having a, a high minimum distance between code words is generally a good thing because it makes it more likely that it will be possible to distinguish once we get distortion after we've sent it through the channel. It makes it more likely we'll be able to determine what the original code word was. And in this case, the question is why is, it, why is the minimum distance 3? So again, it's the same kind of little baby proof that suppose that they differ in only two places, then if, um, if we then computed h of v1 minus v2, um, then that's going to be a difference or a sum of two columns of h. And um, so and you can't and that can't equal to zero. Right? So therefore we can't have more than uh, we can't have um, only two, two, two places of difference in any two code words. Thanks to that property. So it's very similar. So basically, codes with large minimum distances are good. This is the critical point. Because then it's possible to correct errors. And in fact, how we might actually do the decoding then is like Hamming distance decoding, where we, we take the received code word, which might be v hat. And we find the, from the set of code words the one with minimum Hamming distance to the thing that's received. And that's kind of like a voting scheme almost. Um, now, when we have like a binary symmetric channel, which is sort of our go to channel, with a crossover probability p, there's some chance that some of the bits are going to change, and that, was, that happens with probability p or not. And so not, let's say that x of 0 through 6 is transmitted. And what ends up being received is this string. And where z is, is this noise profile vector. It's the, it's the indicator of whatever noise we got. Okay. Now the receiver, oh wow, it's really late. I didn't realize how late it was. This is incredible. Okay, so I completely lost track of time. I'm sorry about that. Um, what we'll have to do is uh, we will pause. I will fix the typos for, for next lecture. But anyway, I'll see you on Tuesday, which will be, so next week we only have one 
um, one lecture because of Thanksgiving. And, um, but there will be a homework due. I'm sorry to say. So I guess, let me ask you, would you rather it be due Thursday night at 11.45 or Friday night at 11.45? Neither are good, are they? Or Wednesday night, eleven forty-five. <laughs> What's better? Not Wednesday. Sorry. Not Wednesday. Not Wednesday. Okay. Those who speak get their wish done. So it won't be Wednesday. Anybody else wish to speak? Friday. Friday. Okay. And then now, as long as nobody says Thursday, then it'll be Friday. Friday, Friday it is. Friday night, 11.45, homework will be due. Okay, see you on Thursday, on Tuesday.